بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So inshallah continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asira to nabawiya. Um, the, in the previous couple of sessions, we talked about the early community of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we talked about the early community of Muslims and the first, you know, forty some odd individuals who had embraced Islam, who had accepted the faith, and became become a part of that initial ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What I wanted to uh, cover and talk about today was some of the things that began to happen. Now that you have forty some odd believers. And they are beginning to congregate together in the house of Arqam radiallahu anhu. And you know, they, they have a presence. And like we talked about last time, the majority of these 40 people were very young people. And many of them were very talented people. Many of them were from the, you know, some of the most elite families of Mecca and Quraysh. And so this basically, to summarize, was something that was getting noticed. It was something that was noticeable, and it was something that was quite troubling to the Quraysh. So what the Quraysh basically did was, as we well know from the seerah, from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the Quraysh decided that, you know, torture, persecution, terrorizing these followers of the Prophet ﷺ was the best course of action. That was the, that they figured that this was basically all, the only option they really had. And they felt that this was something that could possibly, hopefully, scare people away from following the Prophet ﷺ and believing in Rasulullah wasallam. So there's many, many stories that talk about um, a lot of this torture and this persecution that ensued at that time. And this story about the persecution of the early Muslims and the torture of the early Muslims would be incomplete without introducing another very key, pivotal character from the seerah, from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, a notorious figure. A couple of sessions ago we learned a lot and we were introduced to Abu Lahab. And so we would, of course, you know, to talk about the persecution of the early Muslims, that story would be incomplete without talking about none other than Abu Jahl. So his name was Amr, Amr ibn Hisham. He belonged to the clan, the, fa- the tribe of Makhzum. Um, Banu, Amr, Banu Amir was the exact family that he belonged to. And he was known by the title of Abu al-Hakam. He was a leader of Quraysh. He was a very strategic political leader of the Arabs and of Quraysh specifically. And he played a very pivotal role in, in early Meccan history. Because of his character towards the Prophet ﷺ, because of his categorical denial and refusal to accept what the Prophet ﷺ was preaching and teaching, he became very well known, of course, by the Muslims. Uh, he became well known to the Muslims by the title of Abu Jahl, the father of ignorance, because of his extremely ignorant behavior that he um, presented towards the Prophet ﷺ and towards the early believers. So. He's at the, at the center of this story. Because this whole plan of torturing and persecuting Muslims was basically the brainchild of Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl decided, this is it, this is the way to go, this is what we got to do, this is how we're going to get this entire situation under control. We have to begin to persecute and begin to torture these people and scare them away from Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So of course, you know, one of the very, he himself owned certain slaves that he began to torture. But one of the first subjects of this torture was none other than Bilal radiallahu anhu. Bilal radiallahu anhu was uh, an African slave. He was from Eastern Africa. And he was actually born into slavery. His father was a slave as well. He was born into slavery. It said that his uh, mother was known by the name of Hamama. His mother was known by the name of Hamama. He was born into slavery. And so that was pretty much the life that he had known up till this point. He was owned by a man named Umayyah bin Khalaf. Umayyah bin Khalaf was Abu Jahl's best friend. He was his best, best friend. They grew up together, they worked together, they lived together. They were absolutely just best friends. 
And what happened with Umayyah bin Khalaf, it's a very interesting story later on what happens in his life. But after the hijrah, after the migration, this is something we'll talk about in greater detail later on. But basically Umayyah bin Khalaf considered actually for some time to believe in the Prophet ﷺ, to accept the message. And Abu Jahal, when he shared this fact with Abu Jahal, Abu Jahal being his best friend, you know, he confided in Abu Jahal and Abu Jahal scared him away. He basically said, no, you cannot do that. You as a leader of Quraysh, if you end up dis- uh, accepting the faith, the religion of Muhammad Rasulullah then what's to say for everybody else? You're going to open the floodgates, so you can't do this. And that's why some of the scholars say that the ayat in Surah Al-Furqan, that, يَوْمَ يَعُضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي إِتَّخَطُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا That on the day that he will literally gnaw off his own arm, his own hand, that that person will say that, I wish I would have taken a path with the Prophet. I wish I would have joined forces with the Prophet He'll curse himself and he'll say, I wish I never would have taken this guy as my best friend. And some of the scholars say that that's talking about Abu Jahal and the friendship of Umayyah bin Khalaf with Abu Jahal. So Umayyah bin Khalaf is a very interesting guy and he even dies in a very interesting way. Something that we'll talk about when we reach the story of the Battle of Badr. But there's a very interesting story there. Nevertheless, Umayyah bin Khalaf owned Bilal radiallahu anhu. Bilal radiallahu anhu was one of the first few people to accept Islam. So when he accepted Islam, and Umayyah bin Khalaf came to know of this, and obviously he told his friend Abu Jahal that guess what's going on, one of my slaves, Bilal, he's accepted this new religion and he's believed in Muhammad ibn Abdullah and what he has to say. Abu Jahal told him, he said, since you own this slave, he goes, why don't you let me do what I have to do? Why don't you let me, let me try out this new theory that I have? So he said, okay, go for it. It's a slave, what do I care? I mean, you have to understand, it's very unfortunate. We're not condoning it in any way, shape, or form. It was terrible. But the attitude was that they basically thought of slaves like property. It was just like a piece of furniture. So he said, okay, fine, do whatever you want. And it said that Abu Jahl unleashed a terrible, terrible torture upon Bilal radiallahu anhu. Some of the details of the torture of Bilal radiallahu anhu is that he would whip him all night long. He would tie him up and then he would whip him mercilessly, ruthlessly, until Abu, Abu Jahl himself would become exhausted. وَإِذَا حُمِّيَتِ الظَّهِيرَةُ ثُمَّ يَأْمُرُ بِالسَّخْرَةِ الْعَظِيمَ فَتُوضَعُ عَلَى صَدْرِهِ so then what he would do is during the daytime when the heat would reach its peak and it became very, very hot, he would at that time lay down uh, Bilal radiallahu anhu upon the burning scorching sand without his clothes on so it would scorch and burn his back. And then he would ask someone to bring a big old rock and lay it down on his chest so that he could not even be moved. He was immovable. The rock was immovable and so Bilal radiallahu anhu would become trapped underneath this rock. And he would literally leave him there all day long. He would tie Bilal radiallahu anhu to horses and make the horses run. And dragging him across the burning sand. This was the fury of the torture that he unleashed upon Bilal radiallahu anhu. And Bilal radiallahu anhu becoming literally the symbol of faith and belief and conviction and, and, and steadfastness and, and devotion and dedication. Bilal radiallahu anhu became famously known by the calls of Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. He would scream at the top of his voice. He would scream at the top of his lungs that one, one, Allah is only one. Allah is only one. And it, it, this was one of the key uh, examples of the torture that was unleashed at that time. But Bilal radiallahu anhu's faith could not be shaken. And it said basically, and this is where the story kind of intertwines with a few more details. Something we can learn a lot about. So you had a terrible, terrible man who was heartless, who was ruthless, who was so set uh, and, and was so poisoned with the animosity and hatred of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Islam, that he was doing this to a human being. I mean, can you even imagine doing this to another human being? Can you imagine watching this be done to another human being? 
I mean, that's why I, I personally, I, I find it shocking a lot of times when I hear about like young people watching like a lot of the movies that come out today. You know, it's, it's, it's Halloween season. May Allah protect us. But when, when I hear about a lot of these young people watching movies like Saw and all this kind of stuff, I, I don't even understand. I can't even grasp how somebody can watch, you know, another human being being cut up or being tortured. It, it, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to even like watch something like that. Let alone being the one to perpetrate that and do that to another living, breathing human being. To hear the screams, to see the blood, to see that being done to a human being, to do that to another human being. So you have someone ruthless and merciless like this, a heartless human being, barely a human being. And on the other side, you see Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was obviously a businessman. He was, he was fairly successful. But he wasn't like somebody who was just unbelievably wealthy, endless amounts of wealth. But he was well to do. Respectable businessman. But remember, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was an honest man. Which means he never earned an, a dishonest penny in his entire life. He was known by that reputation in Mecca. We talked about this. So obviously if you try to earn a lawful income, you try to play it straight, you know, there's obviously you're gonna make money, but not as much money as somebody who's willing to cut some corners and do some shady stuff. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was well to do. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu passed by Bilal radiallahu anhu in this torture, being tortured in this manner. And it said that he said to Umayyah bin Khalaf, he said that, will you sell this slave of yours to me? And Umayyah uh, initially refused. Until Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had to keep raising the price. And some of the narrations talk about that it became a very steep price. But eventually Umayyah agreed and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu paid him the price, secured the sale of Bilal radiallahu anhu and immediately set him free. He immediately set him free. And this story of Bilal radiallahu anhu, like I said, he would become a symbol of the sacrifice that was made by early Muslims that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu would later on remark. One time Umar radiallahu anhu saw Abu Bakr and Bilal radiallahu anhu sitting together or talking together and they were best friends, they were very good friends. In fact, Bilal radiallahu anhu would be known as Bilal Mawla Abi Bakr. Bilal, the one who is the associate of Abu Bakr. Because he was freed by Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So they shared a very deep, profound friendship. And later on, one time when Umar radiallahu anhu would see him, Umar radiallahu anhu would say, while seeing them together, he would say that, while looking at them, he would say that there is our master. He would look at Bilal radiallahu anhu saying, huwa sayyiduna. That is our leader, that is our master who was freed by our other master. And, and so that was the respect that Bilal radiallahu anhu earned and deserved from even his colleagues and his peers because of the sacrifices he made. Of course we know and we'll talk later on in the seerah about the respect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afforded Bilal radiallahu anhu and the position and the dignity and honor that was bestowed upon him when Bilal radiallahu anhu would be made the mu'addin of the Prophet sallallahu When Bilal radiallahu anhu would be asked to climb on top of the Kaaba by the Prophet sallallahu and call out the adhan of Fatu Makkah after the Kaaba had been purged of all the idols that had littered it, that had soiled it for centuries before that. The first time it was clean and pure and free from these idols, the first time in centuries that Bilal radiallahu anhu was the one that would proclaim the words, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar from there. That the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa had a soft spot for Bilal radiallahu anhu. And he used to tell people, don't speak ill to Bilal radiallahu anhu. Don't say anything bad to my, to my friend Bilal. The Prophet ﷺ had a soft spot for Bilal radiallahu anhu. And so this Bilal radiallahu anhu was the basically first one that Abu Jahl unleashed this reign of terror upon. And Bilal radiallahu anhu kind of became um, the symbol of the struggle of the early Muslims. Uh, along with that, there were many, many other early Muslims who were slaves, who were women, there were many women. Um, some young people, like we talked about some of the youngsters. And so of course being young, or being women, and particularly being slaves, they were being tortured ruthlessly and mercilessly. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu plays a very prominent role in this story because he took it upon himself to do whatever he could 
in order to help these people. And I wanted to share some of these stories um, in today's session. Amr bin Fuhayra radiallahu anhu was one of these early believers. And he was also a slave. And it said that um, he belonged to Tufail bin Abdullah al-Asdi and he was actually a relative of the wife of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Umm Ruman. And similarly, he was being tortured. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, because of the family connection, ended up finding out about this situation. And again, purchased his purchased him from the owner and set him free. And he would continue to work for Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu um, as a shepherd. And Amr bin Fuhayra, one of his skills was that he was a tracker. He was a tracker. He was very good at finding his way through you know, different paths and things like that. And so he would later on play a very vital role in the migration of the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu from Mecca to Medina. He would end up playing a very vital role and help Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and the Prophet ﷺ in their migration from Mecca to Medina. And so this was one of those early converts who was being tortured. There's a story of a woman that is very, very profound. One of the, uh, there was a slave woman by the name of, some of the books of uh, Sira um, mention her name as Zinira, and some say no, it is Zunaira. And that's simply because the Tashkil, the Harakat is not present in classical Arabic, so it's Zanun, Yara, and Tamarbuta. So because of that, it can be read or pronounced as Zinira or Zunaira. So this was a slave woman who belonged to uh, someone from the Makhzum clan. Now again, because she belonged to the tribe of Makhzum, the consequence or the result of that was she belonged to someone from the tribe of Abu Jahl. And so again, Abu Jahl basically said, okay, there's this woman who has ac accepted this new religion, hand her over to me. Hand her over to me, I got this, I got these people. I know how to deal with these people. And he started torturing her. And it said that he deprived her of sleep, food, water. And he tortured her so mercilessly that it's actually said that due to the prolonged malnourishment and torture and the stress that she was under, that she basically lost her eyesight. And she went blind. And once she went blind, then Abu Jahl began to taunt her. He said, do you know why you've gone blind? Woman, do you know why you've lost your eyesight? And he started to tell her and mock her, he said, you've lost your eyesight because Alat and Al-Uzza, the tribes that the Quraysh, uh, excuse me, the, the idols that the Quraysh worshipped, said that Alat and Al-Uzza have taken your eyesight away. They have stripped you of your eyesight because you have disbelieved in them and you've abandoned the religion of your forefathers, our forefathers, and that's why this has happened to you. And it's said that at that time, she was so devastated by not having the ability to be able to respond to him or counter him, that she just simply said, هَذَا مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ هَذَا مَا شَاءَ رَبِّي This is what my Lord had decided for me and that's why I've lost my eyesight. And she said, my Lord can give me my eyesight back. My Rabb can return my eyes to me. Who do you think you are? This woman, slave woman, being tortured, being tied up and tortured endlessly, ruthlessly. She speaks with courage to Abu Jahl and says, My Rabb has taken my eyes away and he can give them back that if he wants. It said that the following day, when Abu Jahl came back to torture her some more, he saw her looking straight at him. And her eyesight had been restored. And she could see once again. This is one of those miraculous early incidents that occurred in the early Sira. These were amazing people. These were amazing people because they were downtrodden. They were easily overlooked. They were cast aside. They were tortured, treated like, treated like animals. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala displayed His mercy and His power in helping these people and aiding these people. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, hearing about this situation, he again moved in, spoke to the owner and said that, I'd like to purchase a slave woman from you. Purchased her and set her free. It said there's another story about a woman called an nahdiya Her and her daughter both accepted Islam. They were from Abduddar. There was another tribe, another family called Abduddar. And they both accepted Islam. 
And when they both accepted Islam, they were owned by a slave woman who basically said that she basically started to torture them. She started to torture them. And while torturing them, she was still putting them to work and, you know, utilizing them and, and basically, you know, abusing them. So one day she came with a lot of flour. She came with a lot of flour and she basically said that I want you to start to knead uh, all this flour together. And she basically wanted them to knead all the flour and bake it into bread and then that's what she used to sell. So she used her slaves for business, she still wanted them to work, but on the off hours when they weren't working, then she would torture them. But she would still make them work. So she basically bought a bunch of fresh flour, gave it to them, told them to start working, and she swore, she said that, لا, she swore by the idols, she said, لا أعت, لا أعتقكما, I will never free the both of you. I will never free you, because that was her business, that was her bread and butter, that's how she survived. It said that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came and he said, Hillan ya um ya ummi fulan. He said that free them, let them go. And she said, Hillan anta absettahuma fa'atiqhuma. She said, You ask me to free them? You're the one that ruined them. Knowing that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was the close confidant and friend and strong believer and supporter of the Prophet, she said, You ruined my slaves. They were good workers, this was my business. And you ruined my slaves, you turned them into these Muslims, these believers. He, she said, you want them to be free, you free them. So he said, فَبِكَمْ هُمَا She said, how much, he, he asked her, he said, how much will they cost? قَالَتْ بِكَذَا وَكَذَا She said, this, this, this. She gave him a very, you know, high price. It said that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, قَدْ أَخَطُهُمَا He said that I'll buy them both. Fine, didn't even negotiate the price. He said, this is what you want? Okay, went home, brought the money back. He said, here's your money, now give them to me. And she transferred ownership and he said, وَهُمَا حُرَّتَانِ He said, both of you are free from today on forward. And he freed both of them. And this is where, subhanAllah, it's amazing. Something for us to learn a lesson from. He said, إِرْجِعَا إِلَيْهَا طَحِينَهَا So when he freed the two of them, he said, okay, now they, they were working on all this flour. They were surrounded by bags and bags of flour that they had to bake into bread. So he said, both of you are free, now go and return all this flour to the former owner. You can't do nothing wrong. I understand that she abused you and she tortured you. But you can't steal her flour, you have to return her flour to her. Forget about returning the flour to her. They both asked Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, قَالَتَا أَوَ نَفْرُغُ مِنْهُ يَا أَبَا بَكَرْ ثُمَّ نَرُدُّهُ إِلَيْهَا He said, they both asked Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, that is it okay if we end up finishing the job that we had taken? Do you mind? We appreciate that you've purchased our freedom and you've freed us. But we were in the middle of a task, Consider this our last good deed to her. Can we finish the job that we had started? And then we can give her her finished product and then we'll go on our way? He said, ذَلِكَ إِنْ شِئْتُمَا He goes, you can do whatever you like, you're free now. You don't need permission, you can do whatever you want. And it said that both of them stayed there until they finished baking all that bread, finished that job, returned to her the finished product and then they went on their way. This was the caliber and the quality of these early believers. You know, we read about them having the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the suhbah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We read about these miracles that transpire. A woman having her eyesight restored back to her in one night, all of a sudden, miraculously by Allah subhanahu wa taala. But there was a reason. This this was the caliber of these people. This was the quality of these individuals. So this was the akhlaq and the character that they had. And so again, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was responsible for freeing the both of them. There was another woman by the name of Ummu Ubais. She belonged to Al Aswad bin Abdi Yahud, who was from the tribe of Zuhra. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu one day saw her being tortured. And he bought her and set her free. There was another woman who belonged to. Um, the tribe of Adi. 
And Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu actually used to torture this woman. Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu used to torture this woman before his Islam. He used to torture this woman. And it said that one day he was torturing her, beating her, and he got very, very tired. He got exhausted, fatigued. Umar radiallahu anhu was a young, strong, powerful man. He got fatigued, extremely fatigued and tired. And he stopped. And he say, he tells her, he goes, by the way, I'm only stopping because I'm tired. Not because I'm done torturing you, but only because I'm tired. She looks at him, and she smiles, and she says, this is Allah who makes you exhausted. This is Allah who makes you exhausted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you exhausted. And that's why you don't find the strength to be able to torture me anymore. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came in and once again purchased her freedom and, and, and freed her, set her free. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu continued to do this um, continuously. And so much so that the father of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu actually became um, a little frustrated with uh, this continued behavior. And so Abu Quhafa, the father of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, who would much, much later on accept Islam, he approaches his son Abu Bakr. And remember, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was, as I mentioned, he was a very successful businessman and he was known for being a very intelligent businessman. His father was a little puzzled. And he said, Ya Bunaya, inni araka tu'ati qudi'afan. I see that you keep purchasing these very weak, feeble, humble slaves. فَلَوْ أَنَّكَ He said, I see that you keep purchasing and setting free these people, and that's fine, that's good, but they're weak people. فَلَوْ أَنَّكَ إِذْ فَعَلْتَ مَا فَعَلْتَ أَعْتَقْتَ رِجَالًا جُلَدًا He said, okay, I guess I can kind of understand what you're doing here. You feel obligated to do a good deed, that's fine, you do your thing. I understand. But he said, have you ever thought about maybe if you're going to invest all this money and all these resources into purchasing and setting people free, why don't you purchase a bunch of strong slaves like men, powerful, strong, physically gifted slaves, and set them free? Because what basically happens? You now have a posse. You now got a crew. You're going to have a group, you know, you've, you're setting, you've set half a dozen people free. A couple of them are scrawny little slaves who are tortured near death. A bunch of the others are women, old women. Did you ever think you should just go and look for the biggest, strongest, toughest, youngest men that you can find that are slaves and set them free? And that way you kind of have some support. يَمْنَعُونَكَ وَيَقُومُونَ دُونَكَ They'll protect you and they'll stand and protect and fend trouble away from you. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, Ya abati, inni, inni, inna ma uridu ma urid. He said, I don't even know what to explain to you, dad. All I know is, I know what I want and I'm doing exactly what I need to do. I know what I want. I'm not looking for def- I'm not looking for bodyguards. I'm not looking for a posse. I'm not looking for a gang or a crew or a bunch of bouncers to surround me. I'm not looking for a security detail. He said, I'm looking for ajr with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm looking to invest into my akhirah, sadaqah jariyah, to purchase and free people who have very high esteem, who are held in high esteem in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And it said that these ayat in Surah Al-Layl were revealed in praise of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, فَأَمَّا مَنْ أَعْطَى وَاتَّقَى As for the person who gives and he is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَصَدَّقَ بِالْحُسْنَى And he does a good deed in the most excellent manner possible. فَسَنُيَسِّرُهُ لِلْيُسْرَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we continue to make it easier and easier for him. This is the beauty of a good deed. When a good deed is done, initially that might be difficult, that might not make a, logic, a lot of logical sense. But the beauty of a good deed like that is that it facilitates other good deeds. Then other follow-up good deeds become very easy and become very facilitated. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu in his lifetime freed hundreds of slaves. Hundreds of slaves. How does somebody go about doing that? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu would bankrupt himself twice in the support of the, the da'wah, the mission of the Prophet sallallahu Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu accompanied the Prophet on the night of Hijrah. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was in the cave 
along with the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu stood by the side of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu was the best friend of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was put in charge by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam of the ummah. How, how does somebody achieve all of this for great virtue? Because when you take that first step and you're willing to do what needs to be done and you're willing to do what's right, even though it might seem a little difficult or challenging, or might not seem like, you know, uh, might not make a lot of sense to a lot of the people in the world at that time. But you know what you're doing is right, and you know you're trying to please Allah, and you keep doing what you're supposed to do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to facilitate deeds for you. And the ball starts to roll. And then there's no stopping that. We talk about a snowball effect, you have no idea what this is like. Because everything starts to roll. And from there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates. And that was the gift of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. That is who Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was. And so, this was basically what transpired there in those early days of Mecca. That when those people started to draw towards Islam and started to believe in the Prophet ﷺ, then this was a lot of the torture, this was a lot of the difficulty that they were dealing with. And Abu Jahl on one side, Ubayya bin Khalaf, these people, they played one role. They played the role of the antagonist. They were the villains in this entire scene. And the protagonist, the hero, in this situation was none other than Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, who was swooping in, who was coming in time after time to help these sahaba, these companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi these such beloved people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and continue to be there for, their, for them. Al, uh, uh, Khabbab bin al-Arat radiallahu anhu was another one of these young men. It said about Khabbab radiallahu anhu that he was kidnapped actually when he was a young boy. He was not born a slave, he was kidnapped and sold into slavery. And he was sold to a man who belonged to the tribe of Khuza'a. He also accepted Islam very, uh, in the very early days of Islam, the message of the Prophet sallallahu And this man, Khabbab radiallahu anhu, was another one of those guinea pigs. He was another one of those people that they experimented torture upon. And terrible things, I talked about him a few uh, sessions ago, terrible, terrible things were done to him. He was literally put onto heated stones, to the point where his back was completely burned. His back was permanently scarred, he had permanent like physical damage that he sustained because of this terrible torture that they inflicted upon him. But once again, he stayed strong and was eventually able to uh, get his freedom and was able to join the side of the Prophet ﷺ. And I talked about how he would also become a very inspirational figure to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, where Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, anytime he felt a little overwhelmed by anything, he would come and sit down with Khabab radiallahu anhu and he would say, let me see your back. Tell me about the early days. And Khabab radiallahu anhu would pull up his shirt and Umar radiallahu anhu would say, I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. And he would tell him the story, stories of the early days of torture. And Umar radiallahu anhu would immediately would say, that's the perspective I was looking for. This is the perspective I was looking for. Abu Fuqayha. Abu Fuqayha was another slave who belonged to Safwan bin Umayyah. This is the son of Umayyah bin Khalaf. So this is a slave that belonged to Umayyah bin Khalaf. When Bilal radiallahu anhu was finally freed, father and son both began to torture Abu Fuqayha. And it said that Abu Fuqayha was tortured ruthlessly and was tortured to no end. To the point where there are even some narrations that say that he was literally tortured near death. He was tortured near death. And so there's one particular story where they had him on the ground and they were beating him and torturing him and kicking him and beating him. And uh, a bug, a bug or an insect walked by his body. A bug or an insect was walking by on the ground. And the Safan bin Umayyah points at this bug and he goes, that's your Lord, isn't it? You crazy people, you probably worship something like that, don't you? And he said that, he said, no, my Rabb is your Rabb and the Rabb of the entire world. Rabbi, huwa Rabbuka, wa Rabbul Alameen. 
Even in that situation. And he said he was so infuriated that how dare this slave has the courage to speak to me, to talk back to me while I'm torturing him. That it said that he fell down on him and began to strangle him. Until he fell, fell unconscious because of, you know, uh, basically he was, be, he was strangled to the point, suffocated to the point where he became unconscious. And when he became unconscious, then finally in that situation, Safwan basically let him go and walked away because they literally thought that he was dead. He thought that he was dead. They assumed that he had died. And only and only then did they finally leave him and walk away. And it's also said that Abu Bakr anhu came in, purchased him and set him free. There's that other remarkable story of some of the early believers. There was a family, a beautiful family. There was an elder, uh, there was a middle-aged son, Ammar radiallahu anhu, who said was about in his 30s. He was the only child very close to his parents. And his mother and his father. His father's name was Yasir and his mother's name was Sumayya. And it said that Ammar radiallahu anhu was one of the early people to accept Islam. And he accepted Islam. It's, uh, there's an interesting backstory too. Yasir, the father, was actually not from Mecca. He was from Yemen. He had come to Mecca early on when he was still young to basically look for a life because Yemen had very severe, we talked about this in the earliest of the seerah sessions that we did, where we talked about Yemen was basically in, uh, in a depression, in a recession. Yemen had very tough conditions, it was in a very bad economic situation. There were no jobs, there was no business, it was really tough, life was tough out there. Mecca was thriving. So this young man Yasir migrates to Mecca, looking for work, looking for business. And when he arrives there, the only way that you could really gain like citizenship in Mecca was, you needed to have some type of an agreement with somebody who was a citizen of Mecca. You had to broker a deal. So he brokered out a deal with one of the citizens of Mecca. And but part of that deal was, and, and actually brokered a deal with somebody from the Makhzum tribe, and so part of that deal now was that he was basically an ally of the Makhzumi people. But he was a very humble man, he didn't have much. So he worked as a, as a servant, worked, you know, labor menial jobs, but it was good, alhamdulillah. And, and he was happy with life there. He got married uh, to actually a slave woman named Sumeya. And they didn't care, they were humble people living their humble little life. They just felt good that there was enough bread on the table, and they had basic safety, and they were happy. They had one child, a son named Ammar, who they loved very, very deeply. They cared for him very deeply. He ends up accepting Islam, meets the Prophet ﷺ and accepts Islam. Now, because of their situation, Ammar knowing exactly his family's situation, he would sneak at night and sneak back in the morning. To go sit with the Prophet ﷺ in the house of Arqam and learn and worship with the Prophet ﷺ. The parents kind of noticed that the son sneaks out and sneaks back in and is up to something. So they wait for him one day, they ask him what's going on, and he comes clean. When he comes clean, they, they're, they're, they're devastated. Because they basically try to make him understand, do you know what will happen to us if they find out? Do you know what they'll do to you? What they'll do to all of us? And Ammar radiallahu anhu took that opportunity as an opportunity to give them da'wah. He goes, no, let me explain to you what I believe exactly. What this is, let me tell you. And he t- gives them the message, the Qur'an, the words of the Prophet wasallam. They were so deeply affected, they both say they want to go and meet the Prophet wasallam. They both go and accept Islam. Abu Jahl found out that this little family that my tribe, my people have given protection to, had the audacity, this group of slave servants, had the audacity to accept this new religion. So he says, hand them over to me. Time to make an example out of them. And again, they, this was a new experiment for Abu Jahl and his torture. Because now this was a whole family. So he tied them up. Tied them up, standing up to poles. Leave them there for days on end. Hanging from these poles. Strung them up. And he would torture them in front of each other. And he continued doing this. And this went on for a very long time. It said that the Prophet of Allah would walk by. Tears in his eyes. 
he would be crying. And he would say, Sabran alay yasir sabran. Some narrations he would say, Abshiru alay yasir, abshiru. Patience, O oh family of Yasir, have patience. He would say, Congratulations, O oh family of Yasir, congratulations. Inna mawaidakumul jannah. You will all be reunited in paradise. You will all be reunited in paradise, in jannah. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu saw the situation. He goes to Abu Jahl and he says, Give them to me, I'll, bar- I'll purchase them from you. He says, No, 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 refuses, not this time, not this time. Go away, I don't need your money. So finally, the mother one day tells Abu Jahl, tells him off, straight up. A woman of iman, just tells him off straight up. No matter what you do, Abu Jahl, we will not disbelieve, we will not be deterred, we will not stop. You can't change it. You can't do anything to us. Abu Jahl becomes so infuriated by the display of courage by this woman, that he throws her down, pulls out a spear and kills her right there on the spot. In front of her husband and her son. Can you imagine what that must have been like? To be tied up and watch your own wife murdered in front of your own eyes. To see your own mother assassinated, murdered, martyred in front of your own eyes. And she was the first one to lose her life from this ummah. So the first martyr, the first one to give the sacrifice of life was a woman from this ummah. And then there are two narrations, some say that Yasir radiallahu anhu eventually died just due to prolonged torture. Some say no, eventually he just completely just was beside himself at the sight of his wife being murdered in front of him that he just started to just yell and scream and fight and squirm and try to break free. That Abu Jahl took him and threw him down and began to kick him. And he said he literally kicked him to death. He beat him to death, he kicked him until he breathed his last. Now Ammar radiallahu anhu standing there, watches both of his parents murdered in front of his own eyes. Can you imagine what that was like? And finally, unable to bear this anymore, now they intensified the torture upon Ammar radiallahu anhu. The narration say, and this is you know something that um, I'm going to mention here just in a little bit of detail because it's relevant to the topic and the history of this situation. But they eventually kept torturing him, kept torturing him, and realized the sight of his parents dying in front of him was the, was the worst part of the torture. That they kept torturing him, drove him to the brink of like insanity, losing his mind. And then they finally said, that say that you believe in Allah and Al-Uzza, and say that you don't believe in Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Say it, say it, say it. Now imagine, just having murdered somebody's parents in front of their eyes, and then beating somebody in the face, kicking somebody, screaming that into their face. Ammar radiallahu anhu says, fine, fine, okay, okay, I believe, I believe, I don't believe in Muhammad. And then they cut the ropes and they threw him down on the ground, feeling that they had achieved some type of victory, and they walked off. Ammar radiallahu anhu literally crawls to the Prophet wasallam, Tortured. Emotionally, psychologically, he's a wreck. Physically, he's beaten. And then spiritually, he's hurting. Because of what just came out of his mouth. He crawls to the Prophet some tears in his eyes. He says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I messed up. O oh, Messenger of Allah, I messed up. This is what I said. The Prophet of Allah وسلم, asks him a question. He said, what, what was in your heart? Ya Ammar, what was in your heart? And he says, I swear by Allah, I have never believed in Allah more. I have never believed in you anymore. My iman was stronger than it's ever been before. Just the, I, I just I was overwhelmed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that situation revealed even ayat validating the iman of Ammar radiallahu anhu. That when you are overwhelmed, when you are tortured, when you are just torn to shreds, 
And at that time, something comes out from your tongue which is not in your heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands. He understands. And He forgives you. And your iman is not violated. Your iman is not invalidated. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because of the revelation of that ayah, even told the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, إِلَّا أَن تَتَّقُوا مِنْهُمْ تُقَاهُ Even told the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that if any one of you end up in this situation, say what these wild dogs want to hear. So that then you're able to escape their, their grip and their torture. Later on, <clears throat> Ammar radiallahu anhu would leave and would migrate with the Muslims soon thereafter to Abyssinia, to Habasha, to East Africa. And would later on meet the Prophet ﷺ in Al Madinatul Munawwara. And that's a very beautiful story that we'll talk about at that time, inshallah. So, this was the plight and the situation of many of these early Muslims and exactly what they ended up dealing with. SubhanAllah, even at this time. This is, and, and uh, one other thing that I'll talk about in this situation before I go forward is eventually the situation grew to the point where it wasn't just the women and the slaves anymore. But even the men and the wealthy and the elite, they were even persecuted. Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anhu was tied up by his, own, by his own family and told that we will not release you, not let you go. His uncle Al-Hakam bin Abdul As tied him up and said, I will not let you go until you renounce your Islam, you forsake this new religion. Uthman radiallahu anhu said, I will never do this until he was finally able to escape. Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, we talked about his story last time, where his mother you know, tried to emotionally blackmail him into leaving the faith that he accept, accepted. One of the famous stories of this nature is Musa bin Umayr radiallahu anhu, who was a celebrity at his time, who was young, handsome, wealthy, rich, well-dressed, GQ. He, he was a celebrity at his time. He was at every, if, if, if Musa bin Umair was at a party, you knew it was the place to be. That's who Musa bin Umair radiallahu anhu was. He accepted Islam. It said that again his mother tied him up and even tortured him. So that he would leave the religion. And when he finally would not leave, when she saw him sticking, it said that she literally stripped him of all of his clothing and threw him out onto the street without clothing, without food, without anything. And he came to the Prophet ﷺ in his humble condition. And the Prophet ﷺ covered him, and took care of him, and kept him with him. And finally that day would come, and again we'll talk about this when we reach there in the seerah, when Musa ibn Umayr anhu would be one of the first deputies, one of the first ambassadors of the Prophet ﷺ. When the people from Yathrib, which would become al Madinatul Munawwara, when there was about a hundred or so believers in the city of Yathrib, and the Prophet ﷺ had a lot of optimism and a lot of hope for the city and its people, that the Prophet ﷺ needed to send someone there to teach these people and to continue to spread the faith, he sent none other than this young man, Musa bin Umair. And he was sent there as a muqri, as a mu'allim, as a teacher, an ambassador, the, he was the TA of the Prophet ﷺ. And he was sent by the Prophet ﷺ and said he was there for a year teaching and preaching. And said in a year literally converted half the city over to Islam. The one leader of one tribe, Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, radiallahu anhu, comes to, um, comes to Musa bin Umayr radiallahu anhu. And there's a whole story that will go over at that time, but he basically talks to him. And Musa bin Umayr radiallahu anhu invites him to Islam and convinces him. And Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu anhu accepts Islam. One man, he converts to Islam. Sa'ad bin Mu'adh radiallahu anhu goes to his entire tribe. Goes to his entire tribe. Stands in front of them. Says, what, what, what do you think about me? What's my position amongst you? How do you all feel about me? And he said, you're our leader. You're the most noble man we've ever known. We love you, we follow you. We're loyal to you. And he said, I've taken an oath, I will not speak to any of you until you accept this religion of Islam. And said, by the evening time, literally the whole tribe had converted over to Islam. This was the work of Musa bin Umayr radiallahu anhu. 
So he was tortured. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, we talked about in detail that story of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu being beaten nearly to death by Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, by his face being literally disfigured. And so this was the situation that was going on in Mecca. Now in the middle of this situation, one thing that happened was, Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, became very concerned. Because now these women first, and first the slaves, then the women, then even some other men. Now even these prominent members of prominent families, everyone is being tortured. This, this, this strategy of Abu Jahl is starting to catch on. Even though it's not working, none of, nobody left Islam because of torture. Not a single person. By the way, that should be known. Not a single person due to torture for, left their Islam, renounced their faith, their religion. So, but Abu Talib becomes concerned that how long before they feel, that they feel like it's okay for them to lay hands on the grandson of Abdul Muttalib, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My dear beloved nephew, the boy that I raised, my boy, my nephew. How long before they lay hands on him? So it said that Abu Talib gathered together the family, you know, the elders of the family of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said to them, that I need a promise from all of y'all that you will protect Muhammad ﷺ. And Abu Talib being a very, very intelligent man, knew the strategy. He recited a poem before them. He said, إِذَا اجْتَمَعَتْ يَوْمٌ قُرَيْشٌ لِمَفْخَرٍ فَعَبْدُ مُنَافٍ سِرُّهَا وَصَمِيمُهَا He said that when Quraysh gathers together to protect their dignity and their honor, and Abdu Munaf, the one of the families of Quraysh, because they were the great-great-grandsons of Munaf, they said, Abdu Munaf, they protect their core and even their outer lying arms. I mean, they protect the people that are a core part of the family, and even people who are remotely connected to the family, they protect the honor of all of them. وَإِنْ حُصِّلَتْ أَشْرَافُ عَبْدِ مَنَافِهَا فَفِي هَاشِمٍ أَشْرَافُهَا وَقَدِيمُهَا He said that if we were willing to protect the family of Munaf, then we need to think about one thing, that within Banu Hashim, within the family of Munaf, Banu Hashim, the greatest... And the most honorable and dignified of the men belonged to Banu Hashim because Abdul Muttalib was Banu Hashim. Abdul Muttalib was the son of Hashim. وَإِن فَخَرَ يَوْمٌ فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا هُوَ الْمُصْطَفَى مِنْ سِرِّهَا وَكَرِيمُهَا He says, whether you like what Muhammad has to say or not, if you are proud of who you are in your tribe, then you know that Muhammad is a proud member of our proud family. Muhammad is the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. تَدَاعَتْ قُرَيْشٌ غَثُّهَا وَسَمِينُهَا عَلَيْنَا فَلَمْ تَطْفَرْ وَطَاشَتْ حُلُومُهَا He said, Quraysh is being called to action. Their honor, their dignity is being impeded upon. What is Quraysh going to do? وَكُنَّا قَدِيمًا لَا نُقِرُّ ظُلَامَةً إِذْ مَا ثَنَوْا سُعْرَ الرِّقَابِ نَقِيمُهَا He said, we've never tolerated disrespect and dishonor. To our forefathers in our tribe, how would we tolerate it now? وَنَحْمِي حِمَامَهَا كُلَّ يَوْمِ كَرِيهَةٍ وَنَضْرِبُ أَحْجَارِهَا مَنْ يَرُومُهَا We will be strong and fierce in defending our honor, no matter how difficult the situation becomes. And we will attack, we will take on and attack anyone who will try to lay a finger on our honor and dignity. بِنَا إِنْ تَعَشَ الْعُودُ الذَّوَاءُ وَإِنَّمَا بِأَكْنَافِهَا تَنْدَى وَتَنْمِي أَرُومُهَا So he calls the Quraysh to action, smart man Abu Talib, calls them to action, pointing out the fact that, look, Muhammad is the grandson of Abdul Muttalib, are you gonna let the, 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 the honor and the dignity, the legacy of your forefather go down like that? Look what's going around in Mecca. Everybody's lost their mind. What if somebody tries to lay a finger on Muhammad? What are you going to do? Think of Abdul Muttalib, think of Hashim, think of Abdul Munaf. And that exactly worked. All the leaders of Quraysh, all the leaders of Banu Hashim, they basically stood there and they said, no, we will not tolerate, we will not tolerate it, we will not tolerate it. And they all gave their oath at that moment to Abu Talib that we will protect Muhammad Wasallam. We don't like him, we don't like what he has to say, but we'll protect him and um, defend him because of the honor of the family. And it said one person did not agree. One person stormed out of that meeting, very angry. Any lucky guesses? Abu Lahab. 
Abu Lahab, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, stormed out of there. Very upset, very angry. No, I don't agree with this. And continued on doing what he did. So this is what was transpiring there in Mecca in those early days. In the midst of all of this, in the midst of all of this, now that Abu Talib had taken this oath from the family that they would protect the Prophet ﷺ, Quraysh put together, puts together a convoy. Remember they had come to Abu Talib earlier, I had spoken about this. And the Prophet ﷺ became very emotional. And then Abu Talib spoke, po he said some poetry, letting the Prophet ﷺ know that I got your back, you keep doing what you gotta do. At that time, they came back to Abu Talib. Now they brought even more people. They gathered every respectable leader they could find in and around Mecca. We got a reason with, this, with Abu Talib. And look at these people, look how foolish they are. They come to Abu Talib, and they bring with him a man by the name of Imara ibn al-Walid. Imara ibn al-Walid. This was a young man whose father was a well-respected man in Mecca. He was very intelligent, very smart, had a lot of potential, brilliant young man. And they come there and they say, Abu Talib, we got an offer. Look, we understand. Muhammad's like your boy. And he's, you know, he was always had a lot of potential, he showed a lot of character, he showed a lot of potential. We understand. And he's like your boy. We get it. Here's what we got to offer to you. Let's make a trade. You see Imara right here? Look at him. Nice? You like him? Right? Smart, intelligent, a lot of potential, very loyal. Why don't you take Imara? He can be your successor, your follower, you can groom him, train him, whatever it is that you had planned for Muhammad. And you very quietly kind of move out of the way so we can take Muhammad and we can do what we gotta do. Let's just make a trade. Now, that's the most preposterous thing personally that like, I've ever read in my entire life. That's ridiculous. That's obviously not factoring in the human connection. Abu Talib loved the Prophet ﷺ loved him like a child. And that might sound very preposterous, and even at that time, at some level. You know, I've read some books of the Sirah where they, they basically say, oh, you have to understand the culture at that time. They used to pride themselves on their family, their children, their sons. It was all about the tribe and the family and the legacy and the leadership, etc., etc., etc. Even at that time, this was just ridiculous. It was insane to propose something like this. But that's the level that these people had gone to. They didn't even make sense anymore. It was just pure foolishness. They had lost complete rationale and logic. And they made this type of an offer to Abu Talib. And as you can imagine, Abu Talib was beside himself. Abu Talib was beside himself. That it said that he actually says to them, in the narrations, it actually mentions that he says to them that you people have completely lost it. He said, this is the worst thing anyone has ever said to me in my entire life. مَا تَسُومُونَنِي لَبِئْسَ مَا تَسُومُونَنِي He said, this, you people are insulting me. This is the worst way to insult someone. This, this, this man, Muhammad, is like a child. Like my child, I love him like a son. You think I would give up my son like this? لَبِئْسَ مَا تَسُمُونَنِي This is the worst way you could possibly, anybody has ever cursed me ever in my life. This is the worst thing that anybody could have done to me. أَتُعْطِينِي إِبْنَكُمْ You give me your son, so you give me somebody else's son in exchange for me giving you my son? Have you completely lost it? Are you insane? And so then he obviously tells them that go from here, I don't accept this deal. And Mut'am bin Adi, who was a good friend of Abu Talib, and an intelligent man, and actually says he was an ally of the Prophet ﷺ, and a supporter of the Sahaba later on, he was there. And Abu Talib looked at him and he goes, Mut'am, I'm disappointed in you. I'm disappointed in you. You disappoint me. I thought you would have more sense than this. 
And so this is how bad the situation had gotten in Mecca at this time. And of course Abu Talib rejected this offer from the Quraysh and told the Prophet ﷺ that you keep doing whatever it is that you have to do. And this was the, the, the sacrifices and what was going on in the early days of Mecca. I want to conclude all of this by pointing out two things. Two take home lessons. Number one, these were the sacrifices of these people. And in the face and in spite of all these sacrifices, look at their conviction, look at their iman and faith. They could not be shaken. It's very important for us to read this, understand this, internalize this, and reflect on our own situation. How easily do we complain? How much do we cry about our situations? No doubt there's a lot of suffering in the world today. I'm not belittling anyone else's suffering, I'm talking to me. When I complain about how difficult my life may be, or how difficult my Islam, practicing Islam may be for me, I need to read these stories. Like Umar radiallahu anhu would go to Khabab, Umar radiallahu anhu with the weight of the khilafah, the ummah on his shoulders, would go to Khabab, when he felt overwhelmed, and look at his back and say, no, no, never mind, never mind. I'm straight. We need to also read these stories of Sahaba and put things into perspective. And the second thing, look at what the Prophet ﷺ tells these same sahaba who are sacrificing at this level, they come to the Prophet ﷺ. And they say, O oh Messenger of Allah, Mata Nasrullah. O oh Messenger of Allah, it's too much to bear. When will the help of Allah finally come? The Prophet of Allah ﷺ says to them, Inna kum qawmun tasta'ajilun. He said, you people are hasty, you people are rushing things. He says, there were people before you, a ditch would be dug, a person would be put in that ditch, and then an axe would be taken, and that person literally would be chopped into half, from the head down. A person would be strapped, would be tied up, and an iron comb would be taken, and he would be skinned alive. And they did not rush, they did not leave their faith. Stay strong, hang in there, keep doing what you gotta do. Even the Prophet ﷺ motivates the Sahaba and tells them, no, 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 hang in there. Keep working. The help of Allah will come when the time is right. And that's definitely something we, can, we need to learn from and that we can expect and we need to remember. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to benefit from the legacy of the Sahaba in the early generations. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta. نستغفرك ونتوب إليك